Good evening, I'm Mike Knetter and welcome to the UW Now, where we bring you experts from the UW community talking about timely and important topics. With US midterm elections just two weeks away, the pressure to mobilize and motivate voters is rising. How have elections changed in recent years? Will policy changes or legal rulings affect voter turnout? Are candidates for the general election further from the electoral center and more likely to represent extreme views? And if so, why? How do attack ads influence voter behavior? Are they changing minds or are they generating turnout? Has fact checking changed the nature of attack ads or their effectiveness? If you're like me, you've probably seen a lot of them lately. And finally, will foreign actors attempt to influence the election and what can be done to reduce that impact? Joining us tonight are two UW experts who will discuss a variety of angles on the midterm elections. Barry Burden is a professor of political science and director of the Elections Research Center and the Lyons Family Chair in Electoral Politics. And Michael Wagner is a professor in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication. I know you two are in really high demand right now with the elections right around the corner, and I just want to thank you for taking time to uh, be with our alumni and, and take their questions tonight. So our first speaker tonight will be Barry Burden, who, as noted, is the Lyons Family Chair in Electoral Politics, a professor of political science and director of the Elections Research Center. His research and teaching are based in American politics with an emphasis on electoral politics and representation. He is co-editor of The Measure of American Elections, published by the Cambridge University Press in 2014, author of Personal Roots of Representation, Princeton University Press, 2007, and co-author of Why Americans Split Their Tickets, Campaigns, Competition, and Divided Government. Barry, thanks for joining us tonight. I know uh, you spend a lot of time thinking about this, writing about it, teaching about it, and uh, it's great to have you here to share your thoughts with our alumni. Uh, thanks, Mike. It's great to be here with all of our alums and friends who are online watching. Uh, so hello to all of you out there. I, I want to talk about a particular aspect of the 2020 midterms, and that is high levels of voter interest and engagement. And I will highlight some of the benefits of that. Uh, you might think it's all good, but I will also bring us down by highlighting some of the concerns that um, are attached to high levels of engagement, maybe reasons for involvement that are not as desirable. So I wanna start with a general statement about our politics today, really the politics we've lived with for the last several years. Uh, this will be on the next slide. Uh, I would describe this moment we are in as highly intensive and precarious. Uh, that is an interesting and fun time if you like watching elections the way I do, but it also puts us on the edge of some dangers. Political scientists believe that competitive elections are an essential part of democracy. It must be possible for one party to win and another party to lose and for voters to have real choices. And democracy also requires widespread public participation. That doesn't mean that every eligible voter needs to participate, but there needs to be a high level of interest and involvement from a wide variety of members of the electorate. So the good news this year is the electorate is highly engaged. If you look back at turnout in the primaries, the spring and summer, it set records in some states. Surveys asking people about their level of interest and likely participation are very high. Uh, registration rates, some of the early voting that is happening in some states like Georgia this week indicate lots of interest. But one warning sign is that turnout is also driven by things that are not as desirable. And particularly in the last few years, we've seen more animosity or hostility between opposing partisans, viewing members of the other party, sometimes not even as human, demonizing them and viewing them as enemies, really, and maybe even against democracy or our system of government. And there's a growing distrust in the system itself, including the election system, but also lots of authorities and things that government does. And those things also fuel voter turnout in some toxic ways rather than in beneficial ones. So let's talk about this current era of big party differences, lots of polarization. You hear that term used a lot. What does that mean? One meaning of it is that there are significant differences between the parties. And those differences have to exist, but also voters have to see them. Uh, 
And here's some evidence that voters are really seeing them. This is a question that has been asked in academic surveys for about half a century, asking a representative sample of the electorate, do you see big differences, important differences between the two major parties or not? The red line is people saying, yes, they see big differences. The blue line is no. From about the 1950s, when this question was first asked until about the 1990s, it was a coin flip. About half of the electorate said they saw big differences between them. The other half said, no, there are really no differences between them. Uh, that changes pretty dramatically starting in the late 90s and early 2000s. You see those lines separate. By the time of the 2020 election, 90% of, of people interviewed in the American National Election Study said that there were important differences between the parties. Only about 5% said there were not. And actually zero respondents said they didn't know. So if there was any lack, lack of uh, certainty in previous eras, that is gone. People are, are pretty certain there are real differences. And if you were to limit this analysis only to voters, the people who actually participate, it's 93% of people who see important differences between the parties. So those big stakes will definitely draw people out to participate. Uh, related to that, on the next slide is that we're in an era of decreasing majorities for the winning party. When a party wins elections in the United States today, it's often by slim margins. There are certainly parts of the country that are blowouts or lopsided for one party or the other. But you can see here, this is one indicator. It's the size of the majorities held by either party in the House and the Senate over the last half century. There were times when one party or the other had a big majority in one or both chambers, but those have really shrunk away. And for the last 20 years, roughly corresponding with the era you saw in the last graph when people are seeing big differences between the parties, we are in an era of narrow margins. This is also true in the Electoral College and the presidential vote in statewide elections in Wisconsin and a lot of other battleground states. So it means that small differences in turnout or shifting votes can shift election results. And that really amps up the intensity of the campaigns and the desire to win now becomes more important and people are willing to, to push in ways they would not have in the past. So where does that leave us in terms of the makeup of the Congress today going into the midterm elections? Uh, it's about as narrow as it can be. In the House, the division, last I checked, was 221 Dems. They're either 212 or 213 Republicans. It's a pretty close division. Out of 435 seats, the majority needs 218 to be in charge. That means Democrats have three seats to lose. Of the 435 on the ballot this year, they can have three flip away from them uh, and still hold the majority. In the Senate, there is no room for Democrats to lose. It is tied 50-50. That's as close as you get. Uh, the tie votes are broken by the vice president, and Kamala Harris is a Democrat. So Democrats technically have a controlling majority in the Senate, but 50-50 is about as slim as it gets. So there is no room for Democrats to suffer any losses in this midterm election. However, the trouble for Democrats is the historic pattern is that the president's party loses seats in midterm elections. It's a very consistent pattern. Uh, this figure shows you the number of seats lost in the House of Representatives in each midterm election going back to the 1940s. So when the bars are pointing downward, that means a loss. If there's a Republican in the White House, they would lose Republican seats that would flip to the Dems. If there was a Democrat in the White House, seats would go to the Republicans. In all of these elections, except for two minor exceptions, uh, there is a significant loss for the majority party, the party that's in the White House, that is. And if we were to extend further back in time, there's actually only been one other exception to this since the Civil War. So it's a very consistent pattern. And again, the Democrats have nothing to, no room to lose anything this year. The average loss in the House is two dozen House seats. Again, the Democrats can lose three and still keep their majority. And when there is unified government, the same party in the White House and in Congress, that loss is magnified. The average loss under those conditions is about 35 seats. So we're talking three dozen on average. That would certainly give Republicans the majority in the House by a comfortable margin. Now, there's at least one factor working against a big loss this year for the Democrats, and that is that there isn't a lot of fat in terms of the seats that Democrats hold that is available for losing. Democrats are not sitting in lots of swing states and especially swing districts that are gonna be easy pickup opportunities for Republicans. There are a lot of hard fought Senate races out there and a lot of house races you don't hear as much about, which there's also a lot of spending going on, especially in open seats. 
but it's not as though Democrats had won by big margins in the last election and are now trying to defend lots of freshman members who are in uncomfortable positions. Uh, when Joe Biden won the election two years ago, his party actually suffered, suffered negative coattail effects. There weren't more Democrats elected to the House because he was at the top of the ticket. Democrats actually lost seats and almost lost control of the House. So that puts them in a more precarious position in terms of the, the size of their majority today, but it means they're not holding on to a lot of excess in the way of seats that would be easy pickups for the GOP. So you may be wondering how many seats will the Democrats lose uh, given these historic margins and the things working against them? I asked my students that question uh, this spring. I teach a course on elections and voting here at the university. And last March, I had my undergraduate students work through a project where they used political science regression models that predicted the size of gains or losses in midterm elections and to predict this fall's election. So this was a prediction that they offered back in March and April for the November 8th elections this year. So I don't, those students are not, I'm not even in a classroom with those same students today. Uh, this plot shows you the range of predictions they made. Uh, the average model prediction from their work was 241 seats for the Republicans, up from the roughly 212 or 213 they have today. So almost a 30 seat gain, uh, somewhere in the upper 20s, easily putting them above the 218 mark. So this prediction, which we're going to find out about its accuracy in just a couple of weeks, is really remarkable because it doesn't take into account actually who the candidates are. Uh, they wouldn't have known at the time that the Supreme Court was going to render a decision about abortion or any of the other things that happened this summer and fall. It's really based on fundamental factors. So this is uh, what you'd expect based on those kind of historic things alone. So that's in the way of prediction. Let's go back to the, my opening point about voter engagement. It's possible this year that we will set new records in voter turnout. And that's saying something because we've just come off a couple of election cycles with really remarkable levels of voter turnout. Uh, this figure shows you the number of eligible voters in the US who voted in presidential elections, that's the upper gray line, and midterm elections like this year's, that's the black line. So let's start with a midterm. The last midterm election in 2018, about half of eligible Americans participated. That may not sound like a lot, but that was the highest turnout in a midterm year in at least a century. And a century ago, our country was very different. Women did not have the right to vote in federal elections. U.S. senators were not directly elected, so they were actually not even on the ballot in a midterm election. So I'm hesitant to go further back than that. It may be that this is really the highest turnout ever experienced in a wide open midterm election in the U.S. So to beat that would be doing something remarkable. It'd be beating history with more history, but I think it's possible this year. But I'll also note that the presidential election in 2020, two years later, also set a modern record. Turnout in that election was about two thirds of eligible voters. Again, not an impressive number compared to other developed democracies around the world, but easily a record in the US over the last century. Probably uh, we've not hit turnout that high since the late 1800s, very early 1900s. Some people wanna chalk up the presidential turnout in 2020 to something about the pandemic or the economic situation that put people in. Um, but the midterm election happened before any of that. So this is not a, a pandemic phenomenon. It seems, if anything, to be a Donald Trump phenomenon. Both of these last two elections occurred in the era in which Trump was either on the ballot or was a major figure. He was president during the 2018 midterms. And that has stimulated lots of participation from his supporters and from his opponents. You, you don't get record numbers like these without high levels of engagement on both sides. So I think you know some questions to think about this year, if we are likely to set a turnout record, is that again due to high levels of participation on both sides when Trump is not a figure in the same way, not holding office, uh, at least for the moment, not a candidate in the next presidential election? Uh, does he still have the power or is his presence in the party or in the national scene still enough to fuel that kind of turnout even in a really different kind of environment? Now, some people will say that voter turnout is driven by voter enthusiasm, and there are questions in surveys that ask voters whether they are more likely or more enthusiastic to participate this year. Turnout will be exceptionally high, but I think we want to be careful about concluding that enthusiasm per se is driving it. Enthusiasm has a positive connotation. People are eager. They are looking forward. They wish to participate. I'm, I'm enthusiastic about the next Badger football game. 
many voters are not enthusiastic. That is not is what is driving their participation. For many of them, it's actually anxiety or fear. Those are negative emotions that are on the other side of the emotional spectrum, but they also have the power to push people uh, into involvement. So this I thought was a really helpful set of results from uh, recent surveys conducted in September, asking voters in open-ended questions, why are you participating? This is not something that pollsters do a lot to really get in the voters' own words, why they are involved. Now, uh, and it's separated out here by Democratic voters, independent voters, and Republican voters in this year's midterms. For Democratic and Republican voters, a really important driver for them is not to elect their own party, but to keep the other party from winning office. It's a prevention activity. It's voting against the person rather than for. Uh, we've seen that even in surveys in Wisconsin, asking people why they're voting the way they are in the Senate race. And it's typically to stop the guy on the other side from winning. So this is not the healthiest kind of voter participation, one driven by anxiety and fear. Uh, there are, of course, other things driving people to the polls, and we want to mention those as well. There's a lot of just general dissatisfaction with the way things are going in the country. Uh, inflation and concern about prices is at the very top of that list, but still lingering concerns about COVID and the supply chain and the employment situation and healthcare benefits and a whole variety of things are, are just nagging at the electorate. And that's that's likely to, to also fuel interest and also work against the Democrats. Uh, there are some voters in this survey indicating that their concern about democracy itself is motivating their interests. Uh, that's more true for Democratic voters than for Republican voters, but the, the focus on voting rights or the state of democracy or their protection of the vote is a real interest for, for lots of people across the board. Uh, abortion is the issue that might be surprising to you. Uh, the Supreme Court rendered the Dobbs decision in early summer that undid the 50-year president of Roe v. Wade. And at least immediately, there was a lot of interest in that and, and a lot of people getting engaged in politics over the summer because of mostly their displeasure with that decision. The majority of the, the electorate would call itself pro-choice. Surveys show more displeasure than pleasure with that decision. But that focus on abortion has really receded since late summer. And people have turned back their attention to crime and immigration and pricing, uh, inflation, other things that are really driving their interest. Uh, finally, uh, that concern about democracy is going to play out in some interesting ways this year. Uh, as you know, uh, Republicans remain more skeptical about the 2020 presidential election results and their validity and Joe Biden's victory in that election. Democrats are, are much more confident, very confident about what happened in 2020. That's been a lingering theme over the last two years. And it's actually carrying over into this year's midterms. Uh, this question from the Pew Research Center asked people whether they think the vote count in this year's congressional elections in November will be conducted fairly and accurately. The good news is that a majority of the electorate says yes, they are very confident or somewhat confident among Democrats uh, there's overwhelming confidence in the system, but among Republicans, there's a lot of division and skepticism with actually a majority of Republicans in this survey saying that they are not very confident. Now, what that does in a year when Republicans are actually favored to win seats, to pick up the House, maybe pick up the Senate, win governorships and other races uh, is yet to be seen. Does that lower level of confidence demoralize Republican voters? who don't see a point in participating in a system they think is rigged or unfair, or does it motivate them to show up and maybe overpower uh, the fraud or the other problems in the, in the election system they think are happening? So I just wanna return in this final slide to my opening one, and I'm gonna embellish it a little bit. Uh, so I said at the outset that democracy requires competitive elections and widespread partic participation, that is true, but it also depends on a willingness to lose. As some people have said, democracy is for the losers. It, it doesn't work unless the losing candidate and lo or losing parties trust the system, concede an election, and allow the rightful winner to take office and then come back in the next round, the next election cycle, to compete again. Uh, animosity, the kind of hostility towards opposing parties and the prevention or anxiety that's driving people to participate just to stop the other side from winning office, does motivate interest and get people engaged in elections uh, but it also might push them into other kinds of participation that go beyond voting. Uh, some of that, I think, is healthy. Donating money to candidates, putting a yard sign in your yard, talking to your neighbors, 
all of that can be a sign of a positive civic society. But if it leads to unrest in the streets, uh, protest that gets in the way of the election system, uh, that becomes really problematic. And so I think we ought to be concerned when an election like this one has elections themselves as one of the key issues driving voters to the polls. Thanks very much. Thank you, Barry. Uh, very interesting slides, and I'm sure we'll have some great questions for you. I know I've got a few, and I know we can count on our audience. Uh, our next speaker tonight is Michael Wagner, professor in UW School of Journalism and Mass Communication. He's an award-winning teacher who teaches courses focused on reporting, political communication, media and behavior, physiology and communication, fact-checking, public opinion, and opinion writing. He also runs the fact-checking website, The Observatory, with Lucas Graves. His work has been widely published across a variety of disciplines, and subfields in journals such as the Journal of Communication, Political Communication, Annual Review of Political Science, Human Connection Research, and many others. His latest book, Political Behavior in the American Electorate, was published by CQ Press. Michael, thanks for joining us, and I know you've got uh, some information that you want to share as well and some interesting slides, so take it away. Thank you, Mike, and thanks to all who are uh, out there uh, tonight. It, it's always a treat to be able to talk to alums and and especially hear uh, questions and, and comments folks have. It's always a, a great way for us uh, to learn as we continue to try to study elections and, and shed light upon them uh, for for our, our students and uh, the broader society. Um, so I'm really happy to have the chance to speak with you tonight. Uh, as Barry was showing you some really great evidence uh, of midterms um, across uh, the years in the United States. I'm going to show you evidence from the last midterm that we had here in Wisconsin and compare that sometimes to uh, midterm elections uh, in uh, some other states. And, and one thing that our research team uh, has learned over the last several years is that there are some uh, uh, stark differences uh, in Wisconsin uh, as compared to other uh, presidential uh, swing states like Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Michigan, and Ohio. And one way, one um, element of uh, difference between our state and these others is the range with which um, we uh, express the trust that we have as Wisconsinites in various kinds of political institutions and social groups. And so the figure you're looking at here the top row across the three panels are Republican voters, or Republican adults, I should say, not voters. Some, most are voters, but Republican adults in Wisconsin. And the bottom panel uh, are, are Democratic Party uh, adults in Wisconsin. And we asked people uh, how much they trusted different groups. So this was in the last midterm. So at that time, uh, President Trump was in office. So we asked about the Trump administration, um, uh, but also large corporations. Um, local television news, the journalists in your state, depending upon which of these five states people listen to, uh, and labor unions. And so labor unions tend to be a group more associated with Democratic Party politics. Large corporations tend to be uh, groups more associated with Republican Party politics. And we asked about the level of trust. And you can, the first thing you might notice is that the range of answers is widest in Wisconsin for both uh, Republicans and for Democrats. And you might notice that the range is especially wide uh, for, for Democrats in Wisconsin with uh, expressions of greater trust for labor unions, journalists, and, and local television reporters, and much less support, or I'm sorry, trust uh, for large corporations and the Trump administration, whereas uh, Wisconsin Republicans were the converse, uh, exhibiting a uh, high level of trust in the Trump administration and uh, some trust in large corporations and less trust in uh, journalists, both of television and from the state generally, and uh, folks who are in labor unions. And this range is wider uh, than we saw in uh, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Michigan, uh, and uh, Ohio. But of course, we don't just trust political institutions. And so if we move to the next slide, we can take a look at trust that uh, our, our citizens exhibit in different kinds of social groups, such as people who live in urban areas, people who live in rural areas, immigrants, folks who are of, of a different race than the survey respondent, and folks who are of different religions uh, than the survey respondent. And uh, once again, um, the range is the widest uh, amongst Wisconsinites, um, both Republican and Democrat, 
And once again, the range is the widest uh, among Wisconsin Democrats. And so the biggest range of, of trusting attitudes where uh, Wisconsin Democrats uh, have a high degree of trust in people who live in urban areas, people who are immigrants, folks of other races, um, a modest amount of trust with with folks of a different religion, not really distinguishable uh, from Republicans on that question, um, and less trust uh, with folks in rural areas, whereas Republicans have more trust uh, for those who live in rural areas, less trust for those who live in urban areas, and kind of right on the neither trust nor distrust line for immigrants, people of other races, and people of other religions. And so here, uh, Wisconsin uh, Republicans look a little bit more like North Carolina and, and Pennsylvania Republicans uh, than they did with respect to the the questions about uh, their trust in, in political kinds of institutions. So if we move on um, to the next slide, uh, another thing that we've learned is that the context with within which people live uh, tends to influence how polarized we are. And so Barry was talking about uh, polarization and uh, the, the level of differences between the two parties and showing how more and more citizens see important differences between those parties uh, and that voter turnout uh, has been high in these last two elections. And uh, one thing we learned um, in uh, prior research that then, which, which we, I'm showing you the, the evidence uh, from a few years ago, um, the, we, which we replicated um, with uh, Governor Evers and, and President Trump, and then are seeking to study again with uh, President Biden uh, and Governor Evers in this election cycle, is to find that generally, as conditions improve, uh, polarization gets worse. And when, when things are tough, people are a little more willing to look to the other side uh, for some help, or at least more favorably evaluate uh, politicians who are on the other side. And so one thing you see here, the, the top row uh, are the way that people answered questions about their favorable attitudes toward Governor Walker. Uh, the higher you go, the more favorable, uh, former Governor Walker. Uh, and then the bottom uh, are the same questions about favorability, but for former President Obama. And first thing you might notice, of course, is just the flip of uh, partisans, where the, the red line in all of the panels are strong Republicans, the orange line is strong Democrats. Um, uh, and, and you can kind of see how when it comes to uh, Governor Walker, the strong Democrats are on the bottom, and for pre former President Obama, they're on the top, and, and the, the same for Republicans. But the thing to notice is that um, for each of the panels, the, the two leftmost panels are about the unemployment rate. And so here, the way we've scored the unemployment rate variable is that the further to the right we go, the better uh, the employment rate is getting. In other words, the unemployment rate is dropping and, and people are, are, be, are, be, are becoming more employed. Um, and you can see that as the employment rate improves and the unemployment rate drops, the divisions between people's evaluations of both Governor Walker and President Obama get worse, they get more polarized. The same is true uh, for population in, in a particular county. So whenever whatever county uh, the people we talked to in Wisconsin were living in, if the county was growing, people were slightly more polarized in their attitudes, both about the Republican Scott Walker and the Democrat Barack Obama. But if the population was, was getting diminished, then uh, the attitudes were, were slightly more favorable, although not, not a lot more favorable. And then the last were health outcome scores. And so looking at measures that uh, other folks here at the UW take of uh, how healthy and health outcomes are in uh, all of the counties across our state. Uh, when health outcomes improve, polarization also uh, improves, if you like, or, or gets worse. Uh, and if um, health outcomes are getting worse, uh, people are less polarized and are more likely to look uh, to that other side uh, for help. And so uh, right now in uh, 2022, you have inflation as being an example of, of things aren't that, that aren't so good. Um, and you might think that might make people more likely to uh, be looking to to others for help. And others, things like unemployment are, are quite good, um, you know, with, with near historic lows. And so all of the data aren't moving in the same direction, which makes the slide that Barry was showing you about how important different issues are to people all the more important. And so for those who really care about inflation, they might have a different response um, recognizing the problem of inflation as compared to those who care less about inflation and more about abortion. So moving on uh, to the next slide, um, another thing uh, that we've uh, been really interested in, uh, in in our work is 
who it is that people talk to uh, about politics. And, and one thing we found uh, in our surveys that we've conducted um, more or less every year for the last six years is that about a third of Wisconsinites consistently say that they've stopped talking about politics with somebody because of contentious political disagreements. They'll still they'll talk about the Packers or the Badgers or the weather uh, or their kids, but they but they won't talk politics anymore. That's one in three of us. Uh, whereas one in five of us in Wisconsin say we've outright ended a friendship, outright ended a familial relationship and just cut somebody out of our lives because of differences in uh, political disagreements. And so who we talk to um, certainly influences our own political attitudes and and also can influence who we want to keep talking to or, or stop talking to. And one thing uh, that we've learned in, in our research, um, starting back in the uh, Walker and Obama eras, were that talking with family and friends tends to amplify partisan differences. And so the further to the right we go in any of these figures, the wider the difference between strong Republicans in red and strong Democrats uh, in orange and leaning Democrats in that kind of lavender color, uh, leaning Republicans in uh, the blue and independents in the green. And so whether it's evaluating former Governor Walker or former President Obama, whether it's uh, evaluating the Tea Party or whether it's evaluating public labor unions, the more we talk to family and friends, the more our partisan differences are, are amplified in our evaluations of these politicians and of these political groups. And so uh, one reason for that is that people tend to be friends uh, with people who are more like-minded and they tend to have family members who are more like-minded. We all have family members who disagree with us politically, but these are just uh, central tendencies. Now, if we move on to the next slide, um, one thing that we note is that when we talk to people who are a little bit more likely to be different than we are, uh, such as coworkers, which, which we don't get to choose in the way we get to choose our, our friends, uh, the partisan differences attenuate not much, but slightly. So you can see the the uh, the the, fig the lines and the figures get a little bit closer together the further to the right we go on these figures, which means that the more political talk we engage in with coworkers, the more we stand at the water cooler and talk politics, the less divided our overall evaluations are of political leaders, but not by much. Uh, certainly not a, a, a cure-all for uh, those who are, are deeply concerned with uh, polarized differences, whether that be amongst uh, Democrats or Republicans. So if we move uh, to the next slide, um, as, as Barry was talking about before, and as Mike said in his introduction of Barry, who's published a wonderful book about split ticket voting, um, we've also investigated uh, that with respect to the kind of news people consume in Wisconsin and the people that uh, Wisconsinites tend to talk to. And so the figure on the left is looking at uh, how much people use news that confirms their own point of view. So the further to the right we go from that zero point on the uh, horizontal axis, the more that Democrats are watching MSNBC and listening to more liberal talk radio and seeking out liberal blogs and and talking with you know uh, or and looking at um, you know uh, sources more like the Huffington Post. And the further and that same uh, logic, the further to the right we go, also means that for those who are Republicans, the more they're watching Fox News. Uh, the more um, they might be uh, online at Breitbart or One American News Network, the more they might listen to conservative talk radio. And so those folks who are far to the right in that figure are Democrats and Republicans who tend to use like-minded sources. And if we're trying to understand split ticket voting, you can see that the further to the right we go, we basically are touching zero, which means there's basically no chance that folks who live in an information echo chamber are going to split their ticket when they vote. The Democrats are going to vote for Democrats. The Republicans are going to vote for Republicans. But to the left of zero, for those Democrats who engage with some Fox News or conservative talk radio, for those Republicans who watch some MSNBC or read the Huffington Post, they split their ticket almost half as often as they, as they don't. And so even though maybe between seven and 10% of Wisconsinites might split their ticket when they vote, uh, the lion's share of those people have really diverse information diets. They are uh, folks who are seeking out news from sources that don't just tell them that they're right and that the other side is wrong and evil. 
the same kind of logic also applies to who we talk to about politics. And so the figure on the right uh, looks at that. So the further to the right we go, the more that Democrats report talking politics with just Democrats, and the more that Republicans report talking about politics with just Republicans. And once again, the people who are just talking to those who are like them politically don't split their ticket when they vote. But those who talk to folks who are much more diverse than they are uh, split their vote about a quarter of the time, about 25% of the time. And so where are those elusive split ticket voters? They are the folks who are, are watching news that doesn't confirm their ideological prior beliefs. And they're people who talk to those who are different than they are politically. Uh, we can go ahead and go on uh, to the next slide. Um, since we are talking about an election, um, it's also worth thinking about some differences in how our elections are run in Wisconsin. And so one thing uh, our, our research team discovered in the last midterm election in our state uh, in a, a research article uh, led by a graduate student of ours named Jordan Foley, who's, who's now a professor at, at Washington State University, is that uh, Hispanic voters in Wisconsin report waiting in line to vote almost three times as long uh, as voters who aren't Hispanic. And so there's a disparity there in how long folks have to wait in line to vote. And in terms of a commute to the polls, Black Wisconsinites report having um, a, a longer commute to get to the polls, which is notable because Black Wisconsinites are more likely to live closer together uh, to each other uh, than white Wisconsinites are. And so despite living closer together, there's a longer uh, commute uh, to the polls. So there are some differences in just the access that people have uh, to voting in our state um, that, that seem to be uh, differences uh, largely based on uh, the, the, the racial and ethnic uh, background of, of folks who are voters. So you can go ahead and go on um, to the next slide. And the last thing I wanted to talk about, so all of the data I've shown you so far came from the 2018 midterms. Uh, the last data we collected was in the 2020 uh, presidential election. And we did a, a three-wave panel study. So both the top and bottom panels, you see there are three uh, panels. The, the first panel, the one on the left, uh, was conducted right before the election. The panels in the middle were conducted um, right after Thanksgiving in 2020. And the panels on the far right uh, were conducted uh, about a week after uh, January 6th, uh, 2021. And what we're looking at here is the amount of trust folks in Wisconsin have toward both social and political institutions. So you might remember that that first set of slides we looked at uh, during my presentation showing how Wisconsinites had more polarized attitudes um, about both political institutions and social institutions. And here, what we're looking at is the level of trust that Biden voters in blue and Trump voters in red have toward social institutions in the top set of panels and political institutions in the bottom set of panels. And so we interviewed the same voters three times um, before the election, right after, and then again, right after January 6th. And here, what we're looking at is whether people are looking at far left-wing media uh, on the far left in each panel, more centrist media at that zero point or in the middle of the panel, and more right-wing media uh, at the far right end of the panel. And what we find is that before the election, when it comes to social trust, so trust in different kinds of groups in our state, um, the more right-wing media individuals consumed, whether they were Biden voters or Trump voters, uh, the less trust they tended to have in various social groups. That really changes for Republican voters right after the election, right after the election was called uh, for then President-elect Biden, but then comes back, as you can see in the third panel, after the January 6th events. And so after January 6th, media use wasn't really related um, to trust in, in different social groups uh, around the state. And if you look at the bottom set of panels, these are trusts, uh, our trust in political institutions, um, the political institutions like the Supreme Court, the Congress, um, the, those sorts of political institutions, um, we don't see um, a lot of differences after January 6th, but saw quite a bit um, during the time um, after the election was called, that's in the middle panel, um, but before uh, January 6th happened. And so this is to, to point out that the trust that we have in our, our social groups in our state and the trust that we have in our political institutions uh, 
um, can vary both as a function of the information we get, but also as a function of what's actually happening uh, before an election's conducted, after there's a result, and after uh, the events of January 6th, these things change, which is to, which is to say that the trust that we have uh, in each other uh, and our institutions as we engage into another election um, are things that can change. And so when we see news that um, is more negative or, or feels hopeless, we know that things could get better. And when, we, when things are good, we also know uh, it's possible uh, for things to get worse. But the, the point here is that um, our trust is not fixed and is is uh, up for um, up for renewal um, all the time uh, in, in our uh, political system, which uh, I think it's why it's important to think about uh, the, the last slide Barry was showing about how it's very important in a, in a democracy for there to be widespread you know, participation and also uh, a willingness for those who lose to uh, concede that they lost and, and try again uh, next time. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much and uh, looking forward uh, to your questions. Great. Thank you both. Uh, great presentations, lots of data to chew on. I'm sure we're going to get some audience questions, but let me start out Barry, you showed the prediction of your students, uh, Republicans plus 30 in the House, so easily in control. Uh, do you agree with that? You know, obviously that was made quite a while ago based on these fundamental factors, but what are you hearing right now and what do you expect to be uh, the Republican margin uh, of seats in the House, plus or minus? Well, I think there's potentially a big upside for Republicans. I don't know how far it goes. I think 20 or 30 seats is probably where most of the predictions are. That sounds about right. That's the historic average. Uh, there are things pushing each direction to sort of either exacerbate that or tamp it down. Um, the, the fact that the Dobbs decision is still lying out there and that abortion is being used as Democrats to try to win back favor is probably softening some of the advantage that Republicans would normally have. Uh, I do think a lot of the Republican messaging around inflation and crime has been effective, and that, that blame gets put on the Biden administration and on Democrats who are in office. So that's sort of the unified government thing amplifying it. What's harder to predict is what's going to happen in the Senate where there are only 34 seats up, so not the whole chamber. It's a little less predictable. It's lumpier because there aren't as many seats in any cycle. Republicans are defending many more seats. They have 20 of those 34 to defend. Wisconsin's a really interesting one because it's the only state where there's a Republican senator running for re-election in a state that Biden won. Uh, but Republicans are competitive. I would say the Senate is a toss up at the moment and it really turns on some of the qualities of the individual candidates you know, in places like Georgia, Pennsylvania, Arizona, where even those of us who don't live in those states are learning about these people. They're interesting. They're different from one another. Some of them are really non-traditional candidates coming out of other kinds of backgrounds. People like Dr. Oz in Pennsylvania is a celebrity doctor, just not the kind of candidate we normally see and lots of money being spent. So Senate's tougher to call, but I, I think there is a, a possibility of Republicans winning both chambers. So, uh, you know, I guess it kind of comes down to polling, too. And uh, we, I know we have Nate Silver coming as a guest of the La Follette School of Public Policy tomorrow night, speaking at Memorial Union. I hope some of our audience will turn out for that. Uh, are we struggling to get representative samples in polls these days? It seems like polling uh, accuracy kind of took a blow in recent elections. Um, what, what's, on, what's underneath all that? What, what are the problems with polling today? Either of you. Well, I I, th I think it's it's always been the case that pollsters have struggled to get representative samples of of the entire public, and there's there's uh, hosts of, of books written about how those who are less interested in politics, less well off economically, um, of uh, less uh, you know of, of more uh, racial minority groups um, are, are tend to be harder to reach uh, in uh, especially the computer assisted telephone interviews that dominated polling uh, for much of the last half century. Um, now pollsters are getting creative with phone and web and cell phone mixes of data uh, or, or, or of, um, uh, of sampling to try to uh, deal with those issues. And they try to weight the samples that they have uh, up against the census or, or other factors to try to um, be as accurate as they can. Pollsters sometimes make different decisions about who they want to count? Do they want to count likely voters who 
uh, have indicated they voted in prior elections? Do they want to count registered voters? Uh, we see differences uh, in, in those. And um, in elections where turnout is historically high, the likely voter measure may not be as good um, because people who haven't voted before uh, might be the ones who are, are showing up and voting. And so it, it's really challenging. Um, on the other hand, most election polls uh, in most states most of the time fall within the margin of error pretty comfortably. Um, and if you have an election like like we tend to have in Wisconsin that are razor thin um, and one person was winning in the polls 51 to, to 49 and the other candidate ends up winning 51 to 49, that that falls within that margin of error, uh, which is uh, part of what we have to do a good job of communicating to people when we're explaining uh, the results of, of these snapshots in time. Uh, can can oh, I just mention, ahead. Mike, um, the, the polls were, were pretty far off in 2020, both the national polls and state polls. Uh, you can see why that would happen during a pandemic. It's difficult in any election cycle to figure out who's actually going to vote. Individuals don't know if they're going to vote, but somehow the pollster is supposed to figure that out mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in a high turnout election with a kind of unusual level of participation that's really challenging. 2016 was also not great, however, especially in state polls in places like Wisconsin. But I'll just note that the 2018 midterms, our last midterm elections, had polls pretty much dead on. In Wisconsin, they were the final Marquette poll was right on uh, Governor, Governor Evers' victory there. So if 2022 looks like the last midterm, then the polls are probably pretty close to where they'll be. Um, there may be a kind of Trump factor in 2016 and 2020 that's not working out in the midterms in the same way. Interesting. Uh, I'm gonna follow on with a question from Steve Goldstein. What's known about the factual correlation between voter survey responses on candidates and issues and how they actually vote? Do we know anything about that? Well, the vote is private. Unfortunately for researchers like us, we'll never know. Uh, I, I think we have pretty good evidence that people are truthful about that question. Uh, there are certainly a small number of people who think it's fun to troll pollsters and give false responses. But as Charles Franklin has pointed out, to do that, you would essentially have to lie to the pollster for 15 minutes straight on the phone because you're being asked as a respondent dozens of questions your views about the president and the governor and political issues and so on. And so, you know, somewhere along the way, you may be detected as a fraud if you try to pull that off. We also know from exit polls that those do a pretty good job of capturing the vote. And those are interviewing people just as they're leaving the polling place on election day. They've now been augmented with pre-election surveys because there's so much early voting happening. Uh, there are other parts of surveys where we know people are reporting in ways that are not about factual correctness, but to essentially cheer for their side. Uh, and those are detectable, also uh, alarming, but findable. But I think when it comes to the vote, it's not so much people giving incorrect or intentionally false responses as the problem that Mike mentioned of just getting the right sample and figuring out who the likely voters are. Uh, question from Peter Strzok. Is there evidence about the behavior of the turnover rate when early voting or mail-in ballots are allowed? Did those um, voting measures or, or practices increase turnout systematically? And and who does who who tends to use them? Do we know anything about that? Barry's actually published on this a little bit, I think, so he can speak to. Yeah, I'll just weigh in on this. There's actually not much evidence that the mode of voting changes who wins elections at all. Uh, there have been two very nice studies of the 2020 election trying to determine if the shift to mail voting actually helped the Democrats, as Donald Trump alleged. And essentially, the effect is tiny to non-existent, maybe a percentage point. And in some cases, actually, has helped Republicans, not Democrats. And historically, after all, it was Republicans who used mail voting more often leading up to 2020. And that so there's, there's not really a partisan advantage and maybe surprisingly also, the advent of early voting and no excuse absentee voting don't seem to have increased turnout generally. Uh, in states that issue ballots automatically to people by mail, there's some good evidence that it increases turnout in low level elections, things like primaries, special elections, off year elections, when turnout's low and people automatically receive a ballot in the mail without requesting it. Not surprisingly, that reminds them there's an election coming and it's a real convenience. But in a high intensity midterm and especially in a, in a more intense presidential election, you know, whether 
it's easier or harder to vote by mail doesn't affect turnout a lot, surprisingly. Yeah, and I can add in, in some surveys uh, our team has done, we've asked people um, who didn't vote, um, you know, why they didn't vote. And, and the reasons they give are not that I did. I, I wish I could have mailed in my ballot or, or dropped off a, a, an absentee ballot um, when we give them the, the, those sorts of options. And then when we asked people uh, or when we look at who does use those affordances, who uses the tools that, that might make it a little bit easier or more convenient to vote, tends to be people who are already really interested uh, in voting. Um, and and it's, it's not the kind of thing that tends to um, make other people more interested in, in voting. And so people's baseline level of political interest is is, is really important. And, so, and if there's a mechanism that, that matters, it's, it's, it's one like we have in our state, which is same day registration. That, that seems to be related to a higher voter turnout. William Schmitz uh, has a question about ads. Apparently he watches some of the same TV that I do. Uh, there's a lot of attack ads airing right now, usually in rapid succession, you know, involving candidates in the same race. Um, and, and William feels like a lot of these ads are misleading, if not false. Um, who, facts, who, who does the fact checking for TV ads? And, you know, can networks just run any ad? Uh, do, do they bear any responsibility? How, how does that work? They may bear a moral responsibility, but um, a, a legal one is is a far murkier area. And and you know it, it, this is actually an issue that's that's become a campaign issue in, in Wisconsin in in 2020, where uh, Attorney General Call has has written a letter asking Milwaukee stations not to air uh, ads that are uh, targeting him. Uh, outlining why why he thinks that the ads uh, are, are are false and so networks can can choose not to air ads um for 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 various reasons but um it tends not to happen very often uh many television news organizations in in the state uh do fact checks of ads um that doesn't stop them from airing them um but they do uh like a a single standalone news story fact checking an ad uh and then we might see that ad another Three or four or five hundred times before uh, election day um, it, it itself. Question about voting. So we've had a couple people chime in about uh, different methods of voting. Chad Helminger wonders: Is there research that shows how rank choice voting could impact? I would say maybe the you know, the nature of candidates that make it to the general election, are they more likely to be centrist candidates? And then secondly, does ranked choice voting actually increase participation? Do we know anything about that? And maybe explain what ranked choice voting is in case. Yeah, th this is one of the hot reforms right now in some states. Uh, this is a voting system that allows a voter to rank all of the candidates on the ballot rather than just pick one. So it'd be number one, number two, number three to a certain number. Uh, the state of Maine is now using ranked choice voting for all statewide elections, including governor, senator, and president. State of Alaska, same thing. This year, the Senate race and the House race using ranked choice voting. The city of New York, lots of big cities, Minneapolis, San Francisco, have been using ranked choice voting for a number of years. Uh, in theory, it should get more information from voters extracted into the election system. Instead of picking one person who maybe is the least evil of all on the ballot or the only one is acceptable, you get a full preference ranking of voters. Uh, the way it works is that if one candidate receives a majority of first place votes in the first round, that person's elected. So it's just like a traditional election if, an, if that person gets enough first place. If not, then in most places, uh, the lowest ranked candidate would be removed and anyone who ranked them first would then have their votes shifted to their second ranked choice. And again, we see if anyone has a majority, if that's the case, the person's elected. If not, you continue to remove until you get down to maybe eventually the last two candidates. So it's always guaranteed that the winner gets a majority of the final vote. And that's different from elections today, where a candidate can win with less than a majority if there are more than two candidates. The research so far does suggest a lot of positive things coming out of ranked choice voting. It's interesting to voters, maybe a little confusing to some of them initially, but over the longer term, it seems to motivate more participation. They often have more choices, and it actually brings in a wider variety of candidates who are willing to run. Uh, probably gets attention on more candidates in a general election. 
And there's some evidence that it produces more either moderate candidates or ones who appeal across traditional lines of cleavage. Uh, in a recent San Francisco mayoral election, the top two candidates who were leading at the end of the campaign actually held a joint press conference and endorsed each other saying, you should rank my opponent second. And <laughs> Each of them said that something similar happened in Alaska this week where there's some interesting cross-party coalitions being built. So it's not a cure-all, but it, it's, a, it's an interesting way to, to solve some of the problems that are troubling us. Great. Um, Charles Weiss has an interesting question. And we talked a little bit about how animosity toward opponents seems to be a more common driver of you know people's motivation in an election these days do you think that's because the candidates that we're producing are more extreme than they were previously so in the past you know as you were pointing out barry people didn't perceive as big a difference between democrats and republicans a lot of a lot of people saw them as similar and your data showed that through the end of the 1990s and you know now we see this tendency to you know there's a lot of negativity toward the opponent could that just be, I mean, maybe people aren't any different, but the candidates are different. Do you have an opinion about that? Probably Mike and I both have opinions about that. I uh, I think candidates are part of it. The candidates are certainly more different on policy views and more consistently different. So Republican candidates tend to be conservative on many things, the death penalty, taxes, abortion, guns, Democrats the same. So you have fewer of the kind of mismatched candidates who used to be more interesting, I would say, than the ones we have today. But a lot of the animosity across party lines is not about policy at all. It's actually not liking those people on the other side. And there are also really interesting studies about uh, dehumanization of opponents and really, you know, just animosity towards them as individuals and viewing them as harmful to society and to democracy. So I think policy is part of that, but it's really reinforcing this broader set of kind of social uh, relationships that are behind it. I, I think that's all right. And, and I'm not sure we can lay this at the feet of primaries because we, we had primaries during periods in the figure Barry showed where there weren't huge differences between the parties. And, and, and so it's, it's not, it's not just the case that uh, primaries are, are driving this problem and candidates have always uh, had an incentive to um, or theoretically appeal to the more extreme members of, of their party in primaries because those folks are more likely to show up and vote and then appeal to more moderate folks in the general election uh, where people who weren't going to vote or pay much attention to the primaries may start to engage as we get closer to the election. And so it's not clear uh, from from uh, the lion's share, I would say, of, of, of public opinion research that the kinds of people that might get really turned off by extremist campaigns in the primaries pay much attention to the primaries if they're not going to vote for them and the, vote in them in the first place um on the other hand uh there's certainly evidence that more and more voters feel as though the system is deeply divided they perceive really large differences between the parties even on issues where there aren't really large differences between the parties and so a lot of that i think is driven by what barry was talking about before and that goes beyond policy and just some people don't like the people on the other side and it it goes beyond ideas and and proposals and and into the tastes people have about you know do they like pickup trucks or hybrid cars or do they like gourmet coffee or you know miller light and you know, those sorts of things are increasingly correlating uh with uh, people's political attitudes yeah i think consumers uh, purchases are really splintering that way that's certainly a trend well hey we're, we're up on the top of the hour i want to be respectful of your time tonight i know it's a really busy stretch here as we come into the election you guys are in high demand so thanks for taking time to be with us tonight uh great insights uh about the electorate and elections really appreciate it and uh i hope you guys survive the next two weeks <laughs> thank you so much thanks right. it's great being with you thanks Thanks for joining us tonight. We'll be back again in three weeks with a topic to be determined, uh, not yet set, but I'm sure we'll find some faculty at UW or alumni who can bring us some great insights on an interesting and timely topic. Thanks for joining us and on Wisconsin. Welcome to the University of Wisconsin-Madison, purveyor of Midwestern values.
values like a hard day's work, lending a helping hand, being a friendly neighbor, spending time with family, staying close to home, enjoying the simpler things in life, and living with integrity. It's these values that make a badger unstoppable.